Luke 8 verse 17. For there is nothing hidden that will not be disclosed, and nothing concealed that will not be known or brought out into the open. Here's the truth nobody wants to talk about. What if humanity was never meant to be here in the first place? Now, before you think that sounds crazy, let's dig into some ancient texts that suggest just that. I'm not talking about some obscure conspiracy theory, I'm talking about ancient records that have been sitting in plain sight, like the Enuma Elish, one of the oldest creation myths from Mesopotamia. According to the Enuma Elish, humans weren't created out of love or a grand divine plan. They were created for one purpose, to serve the gods. Specifically, they were made to handle the dirty work, literally. Mining for resources, specifically gold. The gods didn't want to get their hands dirty, so they made us. Think about that. We weren't created to rule the earth, we were created to work for those who did. And this isn't just some fringe idea. The ancient Sumerians believed it, and they documented it meticulously. But here's the real kicker, this story has eerie similarities with other ancient cultures, from the Egyptians to the Mayans. The theme is the same, the gods needed something from the earth, and humans were their workforce. We weren't put here for paradise or for spiritual enlightenment. We were put here to serve. And yet, we still somehow believe that we are the centerpiece of the universe. Now, let's connect the dots. Think about the story of Adam and Eve, how we were cast out of Eden. Is it possible that Eden was just a holding pen, a temporary place until we were put to work in the real world? The so-called original sin could have been the moment when humans went from being passive servants to questioning their role. They ate from the tree of knowledge, right? They became aware, aware that they weren't just mindless beings but individuals with their own free will. And what happened? They were cast out as if knowledge was the last thing the gods wanted us to have. It's not just the Bible that hints at this either. The Gnostic texts, books the early church tried to bury, describe the world as a prison created by a false god, a demiurge, who doesn't want us to reach true knowledge or freedom. Could it be that what we call God is actually this force keeping us in ignorance, and the so-called fall of man was actually our awakening? You see, this changes the whole game. What if the reason we're here isn't because we're loved, but because we're needed? Needed as workers, as cogs in a machine much bigger than we can see. And if that's the case, what happens when we stop playing our part? When we start asking too many questions? Maybe that's why so many ancient cultures speak of floods, destruction, and resets. Every time humanity gets too close to the truth, we're wiped out and reset. You've probably grown up hearing that we're the pinnacle of creation, made in the image of God. But what if that's not the whole story? What if the image we were made in isn't the image of a benevolent creator, but a manipulator, a ruler who keeps us in the dark for their own benefit? Let's get one thing straight, the story of Eden is not what you think it is. We've been told this tale of paradise, a perfect garden where Adam and Eve were free, until they messed it all up by eating the forbidden fruit. But honestly, does that story even make sense? A tree with knowledge, placed right in the middle of the garden, where they could see it every single day. Come on. That doesn't sound like a fair test, that sounds like a setup. If you know someone is curious, and you tell them not to touch something without really explaining why, what do you think is going to happen? You're practically guaranteeing they'll do the very thing you told them not to do. And that's exactly what happens in Eden. Adam and Eve are set up to fail. The tree of knowledge wasn't tucked away in some obscure corner, hidden from view. It was right there in the middle of their world, tempting them. Why? Because the whole thing wasn't about obedience. It was about awakening. Now, let's talk about Eve for a second. For thousands of years, she's been blamed for the so-called fall of humanity. But when you really look at it, Eve wasn't the problem. She was the solution. She's the one who dared to question the status quo. She's the one who wanted more than just blind obedience. Eve's choice wasn't a failure, it was a rebellion against a system designed to keep humanity in ignorance. And here's the twist, maybe that's what was supposed to happen all along. Maybe the point wasn't to stay in Eden forever. Maybe the whole idea was to get out. 
Because Eden wasn't paradise, it was a gilded cage. A place where Adam and Eve could be kept in check, under control, with no real knowledge of good and evil, right and wrong. They weren't living, they were existing. And that tree? It wasn't just a trap, it was an opportunity. The thing that's been shoved down our throats for centuries is the idea that knowledge is dangerous, that it's somehow sinful to want to know more. But let's be real, knowledge is power. Eve took the power, she opened the door, and we've been running through it ever since. Adam wasn't some innocent bystander either. He knew exactly what he was doing when he followed Eve's lead, but when it all went down, what did he do? He pointed the finger at her, shifting the blame to avoid responsibility. Sound familiar? It's the oldest trick in the book, literally. So, what if we've had it all wrong? What if the true betrayal wasn't Eve's decision to eat the fruit, but the fact that they were kept in the dark in the first place? That they were given a world where they weren't allowed to think for themselves, to grow, to question. And when they finally did, they were punished for it. So, after Adam and Eve's supposed rebellion, we're left with this huge question, who exactly set them up? Who designed this whole system, and more importantly, why? This brings us to the heart of it all, Yahweh. But here's something we don't hear enough, who exactly is Yahweh? We've been taught that Yahweh is this all-powerful, benevolent God, creator of the universe, and ruler of all things. But let's take a closer look. In the ancient world, Yahweh wasn't the only God around. Far from it. In fact, Yahweh was originally one of many gods in a much larger pantheon. He wasn't even at the top of the food chain, at least, not at first. You see, ancient civilizations like the Canaanites and early Hebrews didn't worship just one god. They had a whole lineup of deities, each with their own role. Yahweh was part of this, originally just a regional deity, a god of storms and war. That's right, storms and war. Not the creator of everything, but a powerful god among many, vying for dominance. So how did Yahweh go from being one of the gods to the god? It's a story of power, politics, and control. As the Hebrews evolved into a more centralized society, Yahweh's role changed. He was elevated above the other gods, slowly transformed into the supreme deity. And here's the thing, it wasn't because Yahweh was suddenly recognized as the ultimate creator, but because it was politically convenient. One god, one nation, that's how you unify people. But this transformation came with a catch. The other gods didn't just disappear. They were erased, demonized, or simply rewritten. Ever heard of Baal? In earlier texts, Baal was a rival god, often portrayed in a negative light in the Bible. But Baal wasn't originally evil, he was just competition. Yahweh needed to be the sole focus of worship, and that meant wiping out the competition. Now, let's talk about what this means. If Yahweh wasn't always this all-powerful figure but was instead part of a larger divine system, then the story we've been told is incomplete. What does that say about the version of God we've been taught to worship? If Yahweh had to fight for his spot at the top, does that make him the ultimate source of creation or just the most powerful of many? And it doesn't stop there. Ancient texts describe Yahweh as jealous and demanding. He's often portrayed as needing constant loyalty and obedience, punishing anyone who dared to worship other gods. Why so paranoid if you're the all-powerful creator? Maybe because Yahweh's power wasn't as absolute as we've been led to believe. Maybe, just maybe, Yahweh wasn't the one and only God, he was just the God who won. Let's cut through the nonsense for a second, if the world was created by a loving, omnipotent God, why is it filled with so much pain, suffering, and chaos? Seriously, what's the deal? We've got disease, death, wars, natural disasters, none of it makes sense if the world was supposed to be some kind of divine masterpiece. And here's where it gets even stranger, almost every ancient tradition, from the Bible to the Gnostics, hints that this world isn't perfect. In fact, some of them outright say it's flawed. According to mainstream religious teachings, we're told that the suffering of the world is a result of the fall. Adam and Eve's mistake brought pain and death into the world, right? But think about that for a second. Why would one mistake, 
one act of disobedience justify the level of suffering we see in the world today? It doesn't add up. If an all-powerful, all-knowing God wanted to punish Adam and Eve, why not just deal with them directly? Why curse every single human being that came after? Seems like overkill, doesn't it? What if the suffering wasn't the result of a single act of disobedience, but a designed feature? What if the world wasn't created perfect to begin with? Some ancient texts, like the Gnostic writings, take it a step further, they say the world was created by a lesser, flawed God. A God who wanted control, a God who didn't have the wisdom or the power to create a truly perfect universe. They called this God the Demiurge, and they believed that this being trapped human souls in the material world, keeping them ignorant and bound to the physical realm. And guess what? This lines up with the world we live in. We're constantly fighting for survival, dealing with suffering and death, and seeking meaning in a chaotic universe. It's almost as if the world was designed to keep us stuck, constantly struggling, but never truly understanding the bigger picture. The Gnostics weren't shy about saying it, they believed the material world was a prison, and the true God, the higher power, wasn't the one who created it. Instead, they saw this world as the work of a flawed creator. Now, think back to the story of the Garden of Eden. Maybe this wasn't just a moral story about disobedience. Maybe it was a way to explain why the world we live in is so broken. The moment Adam and Eve ate from the tree of knowledge, they didn't just disobey, they woke up. They realized they were trapped in a world of suffering. And instead of guiding them to freedom, Yahweh cast them out into an even harsher existence, full of labor, pain, and death. All right, let's talk about Jesus. We've been taught this straightforward narrative, Jesus came to save humanity from sin, to redeem us from the fall, and to offer us eternal life. What if, instead of being the ultimate plan of redemption, Jesus' mission was actually a move to wake us up to the manipulation that had been happening all along? Jesus wasn't just some passive figure preaching love and forgiveness. He was a radical. He called out the religious authorities, questioned the status quo, and preached about a kingdom that wasn't of this world. When you look closely at his teachings, Jesus wasn't just offering a ticket to heaven, he was pointing out that this world, the one dominated by suffering and control, wasn't the real reality. He was trying to show us that we were trapped in a system that was never designed for our benefit. Let's go deeper. In the Gnostic texts, which were considered heretical and banned by the early church, Jesus is portrayed not as the son of a vengeful God trying to punish humanity, but as a messenger from the true God. According to these texts, he wasn't sent here to make us obedient followers of some cosmic overlord, but to free us from the control of the false god, the Demiurge. You know, the same one that allegedly created the flawed material world we're stuck in. Jesus kept talking about the truth and how it would set us free. Free from what, exactly? The Gnostics believed that the truth was about our divine nature, how we're not just physical beings trapped in this broken world, but sparks of a higher reality, imprisoned by a false creation. And who was keeping us in that prison? The very forces that humanity has been worshipping for millennia. The Jesus in these texts isn't telling us to blindly follow, he's telling us to wake up to the bigger picture. And guess what? Jesus didn't come preaching about following religious laws or rituals. He was challenging them. He was undermining the idea that salvation could be found through obedience to earthly systems of power, whether religious or political. This isn't the story of a passive messiah offering salvation if we just believe and behave. This is the story of someone calling for an uprising against the spiritual powers that enslave us. But here's the part nobody wants to talk about, Jesus' death wasn't just a sacrifice for sin. It was a direct challenge to the powers that control this world. He stood against the forces that kept people enslaved to fear, ignorance, and suffering. And what did those forces do? They silenced him, at least, they tried to. Because what's more threatening to a system built on control than someone who's telling people they don't have to play by the rules anymore? Here's a question not enough people are asking. What if humans aren't just some divine creation but a hybrid race, part human, part divine? This idea isn't as far-fetched as you might think. We see hints of it all over ancient texts, particularly in Genesis 6. 
It talks about the sons of God coming down to earth, seeing the daughters of men, and taking them as wives. The result? The Nephilim, giants, heroes of old, a race of beings that weren't fully human. The sons of God in this story aren't just some abstract metaphor. They're often interpreted as fallen angels, divine beings who stepped out of their role in the heavens and decided to interact with humanity in a very real, physical way. But they didn't just interact with humans, they created offspring. The Nephilim weren't just big, strong humans, they were something else entirely, a hybrid race that supposedly walked the earth before the flood. Now, think about this, why would these divine beings be so interested in humanity? What were they trying to accomplish? Was it a power grab, an attempt to create a new race of super beings that could rule over the earth? Or was there something deeper at play? Some ancient sources, like the Book of Enoch, a text that was conveniently left out of the Bible, describe these fallen angels not only as interbreeding with humans, but also teaching them forbidden knowledge, weapons, warfare, astrology, magic. Basically, they were speeding up human development in ways that were never intended. And what does the Bible say happened next? The Flood A reset button on humanity The Nephilim were seen as a threat to the natural order, so God decided to wipe them, and nearly all of humanity, off the face of the earth. But here's the thing, some believe that traces of the Nephilim survived. Their bloodlines, their influence, it didn't disappear entirely. It's said that even after the Flood, these hybrids, or at least their descendants, still walked the earth. Think about Goliath, the giant David supposedly killed, what if he was part of this lingering bloodline? What does this mean for us today? Are we the descendants of a race that was never supposed to exist? Have these divine beings, these fallen angels, left their mark on humanity in ways we can't even comprehend? There are stories in nearly every ancient culture about gods coming down from the heavens and interacting with humans, creating offspring. The Greeks had their Titans, the Sumerians had their Anunnaki, and the Bible has its Nephilim. This isn't just a one-off myth, it's a recurring theme across history. And maybe that's why there's been such a concerted effort to erase these stories, to downplay them as myths or exaggerations. Because if it's true, it changes everything. We're not just humans made from the dust of the earth, we're the result of something much more complicated. Our origins are mixed with divine rebellion, forbidden knowledge, and possibly the reason why humanity has always been drawn to conflict, power, and destruction. Let's dive into something the church has been trying to keep quiet for centuries, the lost books of the Bible. That's right, there are entire texts that were left out, buried, or banned because they didn't fit the narrative. We talking about the Apocrypha, the Pseudepigrapha, and other ancient writings that didn't make the final cut when religious leaders decided what we should and shouldn't know. One of the most well-known of these is the Book of Enoch. This text was highly regarded in early Jewish and Christian traditions, but somewhere along the line, it was erased from the Bible. Why? Because it tells a story that flips the script on everything we've been taught. The Book of Enoch talks about the Watchers, angels who descended to Earth, broke divine law, and shared forbidden knowledge with humanity. It's the story we touched on earlier with the Nephilim, but the Book of Enoch goes deeper into the rebellion of these celestial beings and how their actions changed the course of human history. But that's not the only text that got buried. There's the Gospel of Thomas, which doesn't read like the New Testament Gospels at all. Instead of focusing on miracles or the crucifixion, it's a collection of Jesus' sayings, with a clear emphasis on self-knowledge and awakening. In this gospel, Jesus teaches that the kingdom of God isn't some distant, heavenly place we go to when we die, it's something within us. He wasn't telling people to look outside for salvation, but to look within. This is huge. Because it suggests that the early church, particularly the institutionalized church, wasn't interested in empowering people to find God within themselves. They wanted control, obedience, and authority. A doctrine that taught people they didn't need a mediator, that they could access divine truth on their own. That was a threat. So, these books were left out, labeled as heresy, and conveniently forgotten. These lost books weren't just suppressed. They were actively targeted. During the formation of the early Christian church, 
there was a concentrated effort to wipe out alternative views of spirituality, particularly Gnostic beliefs, which taught that knowledge, not blind faith, was the key to spiritual enlightenment. The Gnostic Gospels were buried, burned, or hidden in caves for centuries until they were rediscovered in the 20th century. And when they were finally uncovered, they painted a very different picture of Jesus, God, and the purpose of humanity. So, why does this matter? Because the story we've been told is incomplete. There's a treasure trove of ancient wisdom that has been hidden from us. These lost books don't just add a few extra details, they challenge the very foundation of the beliefs many of us have grown up with. They offer a different perspective on the nature of God, the role of Jesus, and what it means to be human. It's time we start asking why these texts were kept from us. What was so dangerous about them that they had to be erased from history? What truths do they hold that could change the way we see ourselves, our world, and our place in it? So, here we are, at the end of our journey through this mind-blowing and maybe even unsettling look at the Bible's hidden stories. We hope this video has opened your eyes to the bigger picture, one that's been kept in the dark for far too long. Thank you so much for sticking with us through this deep dive. If this video got you thinking, tell us in the comments. We'd love to hear your thoughts. And don't forget to like this video, share it with your friends, and subscribe to the channel so you don't miss what's coming next. God bless you all, and I'll see you in the next one.